Okay. So, this meeting um, is being recorded. All right, so I want to uh, thank everyone for uh, attending our September meeting of the Houston Functional Programming Group. Uh, and today um, we have uh, Rashad Gover, uh, uh, who is speaking about um, developing web, web apps in Haskell. And I will just turn it right over to you. All right, am, am I good to go now? And I think I can share my screen, if that's fine, just to show my slides. Uh, hold on, let me see. One moment. Okay, let me just share. Uh, yeah, I'll just share my entire screen. Okay, can everybody see my screen now? Hopefully. All right, awesome. So, and yeah, I'm on a Chromebook uh, right now, unfortunately. So, I don't know, things might be slow. Let's see. And can everybody hear me still? Okay, let me start the slideshow here. Yeah, so is everybody still able to see my screen? Or? Yes. Yes, yeah. I can see it. Okay, just making sure because I can't. Okay. Um, yeah, so my talk is on hypermedia driven web apps in Haskell. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be introducing um, a JavaScript library called HTMX. And I'm just going to kind of talk about how it can be used to build highly interactive web apps without JavaScript. Um, and obviously, I'm going to be talking about how it's used in conjunction with Haskell. Um, and just so I can get a kind of idea of the audience, like how many people here are familiar with Haskell? Or um, is there anybody here that's used Haskell before? Or Tiny amount here. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, that's not I too mean, we, important. We have a lot of um, F sharp people mm -hmm. uh, use OCaml, oh, so yeah. yeah. So yeah, we're we're familiar awesome. with the basic ideas. If even if we haven't used Haskell, yeah, so. sounds good. Just asking, just so I can you know get an idea of how deep I need to go into each topic. But yeah. Let's get it started. Um, so I'm a Haskell developer. I work at uh, Masterword Services in Houston. They're a translation company, um, and I'm helping them build their in-house ERP system, which is written in Haskell. They use the Yasod web framework. Um, I've been there for about a year now. Um, I've been using Haskell for about four years now. So I, yeah, I first encountered it about four years ago and I've been using it pretty much ever since. Um, I'm interested in mathematics and how it can be applied to the creation of software. And so if anybody else is interested in similar topics, please feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, it's right there. And also I'll give that out at the end of the talk if anybody's interested. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, web development in Haskell is quite great, I would say. Um, we have various libraries, you know, that you would expect that you would, you know, that you would expect to use in web development. Um, things like for decoding, you know, JSON uh, stuff for 
encrypting data, decrypting data. Uh, we have various tools for generating HTML, so on and so forth. Um, Haskell is also very performant when compared to other languages, um, which is obviously great that ends in a better user experience, which is nice. There's also obviously, um, you know, when most people think of Haskell, they think about the powerful type system. So Haskell has all of that. And that's great for, you know, modeling our domain. So whatever domain we're working in, we can use Haskell's type system to model it. And it also leads to easier refactoring in the long run. So if business requirements change, thanks to the type system, we're able to adapt, um, you know, without too much worry that we're going to break too much of our code. Also, you know, there's a lot of great frameworks uh, for Haskell. So like I mentioned earlier at the company that I work for, we use the Yasol web framework. That's a full stack web framework um, for basically server side rendered websites. There's also tools like Servant, um, which is very popular in the Haskell community. And we also have, you know, Django-like frameworks like IHP, which are pretty much batteries included and um, very approachable to even beginners. Um, so, and there's a lot more than just these. These are just the ones that are the most popular. Um, and yeah, even though Haskell, you know, Haskell is great mostly for server-side web programming. The thing uh, that's lacking in the Haskell ecosystem is, you know, front-end library. So libraries for doing front-end programming, there are some, and I'll talk about them in a moment. But compared to the alternatives out there, um, they're not, they're a lot more difficult to use. And so the barrier of entry to using these uh, Haskell front end frameworks is a lot higher. Um, and so, yeah, that's the main reason why I'm doing this talk is to kind of show an alternative to using some of those more complicated front end uh, Haskell web frameworks. And so I'll kind of talk about those in a minute, but I wanted to show this, this is, um, by Gabriela Gonzalez. Um, she wrote a state of the Haskell ecosystem article and it kind of goes in, it kind of breaks down, um, you know, the various domains that Haskell is good in or not so good in and so on and so forth. And so you can kind of look at this here and kind of see for server side web programming, you know, Haskell is considered pretty mature, which I would definitely agree with. Um, you know, just based off of the reasons that I gave earlier in the previous slide. Uh, but for on the front end, things aren't as good. Um, and I'll kind of explore some of those options that, you know, what, so I kind of want to explore as a Haskell developer, what are the options that you have for implementing the client of your web app? Um, and so we'll kind of go into that. And so, yeah, so as a Haskell developer, obviously, well, let's just start with the most basic type of website that you can make. You can just do a server-side rendered website or web app where that's basically where you just render all of the HTML on your server. And as I mentioned earlier, Haskell has a lot of useful libraries for that. Um, so that's the most basic, but usually, you know, for most modern websites and web applications, you want more, you know, interactivity. Um, so, and for that, people usually go to JavaScript. And so that's the first step. Um, you can use vanilla, plain, just plain vanilla JavaScript to add a little bit of interactivity to your web app. Um, another place that a lot of Hasklers like to look when it comes to web development on the front end is, um, you know, these front end functional programming languages like Elm, PureScript, ReasonML, I'm sure a lot of us here have heard about it. 
Um, I know in F sharp land, um, I forget the name of it, but they have something that compiles down to JavaScript. So the F sharp's uh, support for that is very good as well. So these are alternatives. Uh, the downside of going to these though, is that you lose, um, well, as a Haskell developer, you're not using Haskell anymore, which can be kind of a, 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 a downer, I would say, um, but it's not the end of the world. Um, same thing with a lot of these other SPA frameworks like React, uh, Views, Velt. So obviously those are also options, right? Um, you can basically make, turn your Haskell server into just a JSON API and then just kind of have these front end frameworks kind of query the API and then the front end framework will kind of do their thing on the front end. Um, and each of these are different, obviously. Um, so I don't have it on this list right here, but I should have had it, um, there's something called GHCJS in the Haskell ecosystem. But the downsides of GHCJS are that the tool chain to get it set up is very difficult, I would say. I mean, to get, to get your developer machine set up to use GHCJS isn't really easy. Uh, to be fair, I haven't used it in a while. Um, you know, the last time I brought this up to another Haskell developer, they kind of mentioned that things have gotten better with GHCJS, but um, it, it is a lot more difficult than I would say some of these other options on the list. So usually you have to use Nix and involve a lot of other things that just bring in a lot of complexity. And so... But the upside of GHCJS obviously is that you get to use Haskell, so you can use Haskell full stack. You get to share all of your data types and all of that good stuff, which is nice. Um, and then there's also, I think in the works, there's a Haskell to WebAssembly compiler. So that might be something in the future. You know, the last time I checked on the status of that project, it's not 100% um, there yet. Um, and so, yeah, currently that's not really an option, but it may be in the future. And I also want to mention, you know, for some of these other front end functional programming languages like Elm, PureScript, ReasonML, so on and so forth, Haskell does provide helpers that kind of help you generate um, functions so you can query your Haskell API um, without having to implement all of those functions yourself. So I know for Elm, there's something called Elm Servant. And so if you write your backend using the Servant framework, um, it'll also allow you to generate functions, generate Elm code to query that API, that server. And so that does remove a lot of boilerplate and overhead, but um, it's still not Haskell, you know, as I said earlier. So let's see yeah so those are basically all the options that a Haskell developer has um, when it comes to doing client-side programming on the web but I do in this talk I'm proposing another alternative called HTMX and so let's see what that looks like really quick and I'm actually going to exit out of these slides real quick and kind of show an example of the HTMX website. But before that, let me just talk a little bit about what HTMX is. Um, so HTMX is basically an extension of HTML. And so it makes HTML more powerful. And it um, gives HTML capabilities such as you're able to submit AJAX requests from any HTMX element, I mean any HTML element. So you're not only limited to get and post requests using forms um, and other, or just using anchor tags to link to another page, but you can actually turn any HTML element into an interactive element that can make requests to the server and then your server returns HTML 
and um, HTMX will place that HTML into the DOM. So I'll, it's kind of hard to explain. I'll have to show examples in order for it to make sense. But um, the great thing about HTMX is that it's language agnostic, meaning you can use HTMX with any server-side programming language as long as you can generate HTML, which um, I'm pretty sure all server-side programming languages can do. So you can use anything, um, Haskell, F-sharp, APL, Elixir, so on and so forth. Another thing is that it's very simple. There's no uh, build pipeline. So another thing that I forgot to mention with, you know, a lot of these other alternatives like React, Vue, Elm, PureScript, whatever else, you have to bring in a whole new, a whole nother tool chain for your client. Um, and that obviously, like I said, with G GHCJS, it brings in a lot of complexity and overhead that most of the time we'd like to avoid. Uh, so with HTMX, you just, Put a script tag into your HTML and bam, it's right there. You don't have to do anything else. There's no build, no bundling, no NPM, none of that. So that's great. It's also small, very tiny, especially compared to a lot of these other front end frameworks. Uh, that's another issue with GHCJS that I forgot to mention is that the code that GHCJS produces is kind of bloated. You know, when you're going from Haskell code to JavaScript code, um, it's not really an efficient conversion. And so, but that is something that may be improved upon in the future. But um, yeah, HTMX is just a lot smaller uh, when you're comparing it with a lot of these other SPA frameworks. And um, yeah, it's a friendly community. It's growing fast. So I have this graph here, it kind of shows like how it's been taking off. I'm not sure if anybody's heard about it before this talk, you might've heard about it, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, it is getting pretty popular, I would say. And uh, it is a very interesting alternative to things like React and stuff like that. And so actually, I kind of just want to show some, a few things. Uh, Let's go to the HTMX website so I can kind of show you what this does actually. And so we'll go to some of the examples here. Um, but yeah, and, and before I even go into any of these examples, I want to say that none of these use JavaScript. Now, HTMX ex itself is implemented in JavaScript. But, you know, as a user of HTMX, you won't have to deal with any JavaScript. And so you can create these really rich uh, UI interactions without any JavaScript. This is all HTML. And so we can do things like edit stuff. And I'll be kind of showing a little bit of this in my own example. But, um, and so you would submit this to the server and then you get a response. And the response that the server returns is HTML. So this is different from um, other SPA frameworks. Usually you would return JSON, right? And then your SPA framework would take that JSON and then manipulate that accordingly. But with HTMX, we're returning HTML. And so the state of the application is actually encoded in the HTML. And so I'll kind of go into that a little bit later, but that is an important thing to know. And so, yeah, we can kind of see this tool right here. It kind of shows what's being returned when uh, a response is sent. So let me see if I click to edit. So actually right there, when I click on this edit button, there's a form being returned by the server and it, HTMX is putting that form into the DOM. And so now I have a form that I can edit. And then when I go ahead and edit this, uh, I don't know, whatever. And then we submit that. And then once again, when we hit that submit button and sending the form contents to the server, and then the server is returning more HTML back to the client. And now we have 
uh, the new contents of the form right here. And there's some other um, things right here, just to kind of show around. Yeah, so this is an example of like a table. We can delete uh, things, obviously. And as you can see, there's animations. Um, and basically anything that you would expect and you know, from the SPA framework, you can do in HTMX as well which is nice. This is a nice example of like lazy loading. Um, let's see, there was another example that I really liked. Okay, yeah, infinite scroll. This is another example. So you can add like, this is lazily loading a list of contents, so on and so forth. And so that's how HTMX kind of works in a nutshell, but we'll, We'll dive into it more as we go on. Okay, can, can I jump in here and ask a question? Yeah, definitely. So I'm, I'm definitely. Is HTMX like <laughs> yeah an HTML like HTML like language or yes yeah so I completely skip that I'm sorry so let's like let's actually see how we use it so HTMX is used so you basically add these attributes to your HTML elements. And so that's what I meant earlier by when I said, um, you know, we can basically turn any HTML element in the DOM into an interactive thing that can interact with the server. And so like as an example here, um, this is a table row and we're turning this, we're making this table row uh, make a GET request to this URL, and this URL is returning more HTML back to the client. And so, yeah, HTMX is basically all attributes. So we have attributes like HX GET, HX Trigger, HX Swap, so on and so forth. And there's a whole reference of these attributes right here. So you have basically attributes for every um, HTTP method, so get, post, put, delete, so on and so forth. And there's various modifiers. You can um, trigger requests on different events. So HTMX is very event oriented. So you can, for example, trigger a post request when the user hits the H key or when the user right clicks or basically anything you can imagine. Um, I mean, that's within the limitations of the browser, obviously. Uh, so any event that JavaScript exposes, you can listen to that and you can trigger, your HTML elements can trigger your request to the server. And so that's kind of the idea behind that. Um, did, did I answer your question? Yes. Hopefully, yes. but that's basically yeah. how it's used. Yeah, it's all HTML attributes. So no, that's, great. that's what makes it very, you know, easy and simple to use. Um, yeah, if you're, so this is why I really came to like, uh, love it is just because, you know, I, I'm more of a backend heavy developer. And so it was great. I mean, as long as you know HTML, you can use HTMX with no issue. Um, yeah, and so it's kind of, uh, look at this and so yeah htmx it really simplifies the whole web development um <laughs> uh process i would say you know um in 2004 i can't really speak for 2004 because i wasn't doing web development back then but apparently you know when i talked to a lot a lot of older web developers they say it was a lot simpler then and, um, you know, part of that is because server side rendering was a big thing. Users didn't really expect like super interactive websites like most users today expect. And so I guess, you know, part of that is that expectations were just different back then. But slowly as the web, as users, you know, wanted more and more 
you know, interactivity on the client, um, developers had to adapt by using JavaScript. And from that, JavaScript frameworks evolved. And that's how we have React and a lot of these other, um, a lot of these other SPA frameworks. So that's kind of the birth of the single page application. You know, people wanted more responsive, more rich interactions with the client. And so um, that's kind of this 2019 stage where it seems like there's a lot of complexity involved. Um, but now with HTMX, we're kind of back to this more simpler model where our server is just rendering HTML. And so we're not managing state in two places. So with a traditional SPA, you have to manage state on the client side and also on the server. And the kind of goal with that type of architecture is just getting everything to synchronize correctly and things like that. And it, it when you think about it, it is kind of weird um, because we're getting JSON from the server and then we're we're gonna we're processing that JSON into HTML at the end of the day. And a lot of these SPA frameworks, they use things like a virtual DOM. And yeah, it just introduces a, a lot of layers to, to the stack that um, aren't really necessary when you have something like HTMX. Because with HTMX, we're making a request to the server, and then the, the server returns more HTML. And then whatever HTML was returned, that determines the actions that the user can take next. And so there's this really big idea here where the state of your application is encoded in the HTML itself. And so it's basically just, you can kind of think of it like a state machine where an HTML page is like a new state and then that determines depending on what HTMX attributes are on the page, that kind of determines what actions the user can take next. And so we'll kind of showcase that in a bit. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of interesting. And so, yeah, we're kind of going back to this, a more older architecture, I guess, with server-side rendering instead of an SPA. Um, so what does this mean for web developers using Haskell? Well, it means a few good things. We no longer need a separate tool chain to implement interactive front ends. So we kind of get rid of the need. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier with, you know, a lot of the SPA frameworks like Elm, ReasonML, React, Svelte, so on and so forth, you have to introduce a separate tool chain to, you know, build that system. And so that's more maintenance, more complexity. Um, and now as a Haskell, if you're a Haskell backend developer, you can now just use 100% Haskell to implement your client as well. There's various, you know, libraries, as I mentioned a few times already to ge for generating HTML. And so that's all you need to use HTMX. All, all we need to do is generate HTML and return it to the client when it's requested. And um, yeah, we can use all of the amazing server-side libraries and frameworks that we know and love, which is great. So this is compatible with any Haskell framework. Um, like at my company, Masterword Services, we've introduced HTMX in, uh, to our Yasod backend. So yeah, it works great. It's, it really fits in uh, smoothly. So we still have other parts of the, the application that are still the, the more traditional SPA architecture. But um, yeah, HTMX works just fine with it um, side by side. There's no issues. You just have to implement endpoints that return HTML instead of JSON. And so that's the, that's the main thing. And another great thing that I like is we get to use all of our types and everything. And so I, I guess it's, you know, we get a lot of the benefits that you would get from like, a, from using something like GHCJS where, um, 
you know, I'm sure some of us have heard of the term isomorphic web apps where we can share code on the front and the back end. Well, HTMX allows us to do this with Haskell, which is great. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's build something with Haskell and HTMX. And so, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. We'll dive a little bit into this. Um, uh, unfortunately, the, pro uh, the demo project that I brought along um, is kind of out of whack, but we'll kind of do a live coding session and we'll kind of discover with each other, you know, how to use this in conjunction with Haskell. And hopefully even people that aren't using Haskell, you know, you'll be able to apply this to whatever language you use um, because it's all very similar at the end of the day. So that's great. Um, yeah, so uh, in this live coding session, I'm gonna be using Lucid for generating HTML and generating the HTMX attributes. And so we'll kind of see how that works. Uh, Lucid is a monadic DSL for generating HTML. Um, I was going to use relate for data persistence, but Postgres isn't currently working on my uh, development server right now. So we're gonna, we're gonna use uh, something else, but I would recommend relate. If you, if you can use Postgres, I would recommend relate. Relate is also another monadic DSL. Um, and then we're going to also be using uh, a library called OKP for routing HTTP requests. So OKP is a new framework um, that I've been working on. It was inspired by Giraffe. Um, so I know there's some F Sharp developers out there. Um, F Sharp is a Giraffe. I mean, <laughs> Giraffe is an F sharp web framework. And so, you know, I was kind of inspired by the simplicity of Giraffe and I wanted to implement something similar um, to that, but in Haskell. And so that's what OKP is. And so we'll be using these three tools. We won't be using Relate, but we'll use something else to fill that gap. Um, yeah, and let's go along. And yeah, kind of as we kind of go through this uh, live coding session, I just, you know, want everybody to keep this in mind that, so there's actually a term for this, you know, encoding your application state in the HTMLs, it's uh, HALOS. It's not the best acronym, um, but yeah, that is hypermedia. It just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> I know. Yeah, hypermedia as the engine of application state. And so this means that the state of the application is encoded in the hypermedia itself. The hypermedia return to the client determines the next set of possible actions that the user can take against the server. And so I just kind of, you know, put in some generic image of a state machine diagram here. But basically, that's what this is, is you can imagine each of these nodes is sort of like an HTML page and the arrows going from one node to another, these edges are basically the HTMX attributes. So we can do like a, a, a HX get, and then we would move on, we would transition to the next HTML page, depending on what the server returns to us. So the server is, is basically in control, it's determining based on what the user does, okay, I'm going to present this next set of actions. And from the next node, we can go to another node, so on and so forth. And so that's really the core idea behind all of this. Um, can, can I ask something? Yes, um, definitely, I don't, definitely. I don't know if this is the same thing, because you're talking about hypermedia here. So I was looking at yeah. the HTMX web page. And early on on the homepage, they say something about um, HTMX completes HTML as a hypertext, but then they just yes. link to the Wikipedia page and hypertext. And so I'm wondering, they're, they're obviously trying to say something about HTML is not fully hypertext and, and 
does that matter and what do they mean? <laughs> it's, I guess it's my question. Yeah, no, mean, that's a great matter? question. And this is something I'm still, you know, doing research in. Uh, the creator of HTMX is very knowledgeable in this area. His name is Carson Gross. And, um, you know, he mentioned, so the, the father of um, the sort of REST architecture and, you know, hypertext is Dr. Roy Fielding. And he was a big proponent of this idea of, of HADOAS. Um, but yeah, as you said, and as Carson Gross has noted, HTML doesn't fully implement, um, you know, what hypermedia was meant to be, um, you know, that's because of the fact that, you know, in plain HTML5, the only way we can interact with the server through the hypermedia is by like submitting a form or clicking an anchor tag. Those are pretty much the only two things that allow you to interact with the server in just plain HTML. You have anchor tags, which you click on the link, um, which makes a call to the server, and then that takes you to, and the downside of those interactions is that it reloads the page. And so I kind of forgot to mention that earlier is that, um, you know, that's another reason why as, you know, web development became more and more modern and people expected richer and richer interactions, that sort of became like something that we didn't want. We didn't, we didn't want to reload the entire page each time um, we got some data from the server. And so HTMX solves that problem. Um, and yeah, as it states on the HTMX website, it is truly an extension of HTML and it makes HTML, it brings HTML to its fullest potential. And so it kind of gets rid of the need for, I mean, the reason for JavaScript coming into the picture was because HTML was lacking in those areas. And so, yeah, and we kind of left HTML in the dust and we kind of went all in into JavaScript. But with HTMX, we're kind of revisiting that fork in the road and we're kind of saying, hey, okay, what if we didn't put all of our eggs into JavaScript and we kind of improved HTML? Let's improve HTML and let's make, you know, HTML what it was really meant to be. And okay. so that's kind of the whole idea behind it. No, that, that's helpful. So my follow-up question is, um, yeah. is HTML plus JavaScript considered fully hypertext or fully hypermedia? Um, no, I would say no, because... So the core thing in order for, um, in order for, in order for this to work to its fullest potential, hypermedia has to be the engine of application state. So HTML is hypermedia, but it doesn't allow for this HADOAS, um, concept that we're trying to, that we're trying to bring out, um, and that's because HTML is just limited in power, as I kind of expressed earlier. Now, HTML plus JavaScript, that gave you the interactivity, but there's a disconnect there because, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's just a lot of, we have now, when we introduce JavaScript as the picture, we have to manage state on both the server and the client, if that makes sense. And so, the, the, the core concept of HADOWAS is that we can just use hypermedia to encode our state and we need nothing else. And so that's kind of the idea behind it. Um, but funnily, uh, it's funny because HTMX, HTMX itself is implemented in JavaScript. And so, yeah, I guess, so I guess you could say, yeah, HTMX, I mean, HTML plus JavaScript does create this true hypermedia the way we would like it. Um, or the way uh, Dr. Roy Fielding would have liked it, the way he kind of uh, described it in his PhD work. Um, and this goes into a whole nother conversation and I'd like to you know, talk about it after if you'd like, but the whole history with REST. So apparently what we consider to be a REST architecture, uh, REST architecture isn't really REST. 
Um, and I recently learned this myself, but um, there's some quotes by Roy Fielding and I'm not quoting him exactly, but he did have a blog post and maybe I can bring it up right now just so we can see the title. Uh, Roy Fielding. Yeah, and so the, I, I recommend everybody read this blog post if you get a chance. Um, but he's basically saying REST APIs must be hypertext driven. And so, yeah, it really just all comes back to this idea that the, the hypermedia is supposed to be driving the state of the application. It shouldn't be. And there's a lot of benefits to this um, that I won't really dive in too much now. And I haven't really experienced them all myself either. This is something I'm new to and I'm still discovering. Um, but yeah, it is, uh, it is interesting. It is definitely interesting. So yeah, I recommend everybody read that when you get a chance. Um, but kind of moving along, let's see. Okay, so yeah. Now I guess we can uh, get into our live coding session. <laughs> so if everybody's fine with that, we can kind of. And so, yeah, I have a to-do app here. And that's what I kind of wanted to use to, to showcase this. Um, and so I'll kind of walk through it and we might run into a bug or something later on. Like I said earlier, my uh, development machine is kind of, uh, it's not agreeing with me today. But um, yeah, so this is our to-do app and I'm not gonna dive too much into like the implementation details, like how all of this works. This is what OKAP looks like. So this is the web framework I was talking about earlier that I've been working on. Um, and so this is the top level API. And so we have a home page. And so let's see, what does the home page do? Well, it accepts a get request. It selects all the to do's if we have any, and then it returns um, all of those to do's is HTML. And so this is the entry point into our application. So if, if we were to envision our application is like a state machine, this would be the first node. This is when the user is going to the home page. And so this loads in everything. Um, like, so as you can see here, we have a script. So this is all you need to use HTML. You just put this in the top of your, your HTML document and then bam. You have access to all of those HTMX attributes and you're ready to go. And um, maybe I guess I should explain like, so this right here is Lucid. And so it's a, it's a monadic DSL. And so, you know, monads in Haskell, they allow you to use the do syntax. So we have all of these do blocks right here. And yeah, you basically just nest HTML tags within each other. So I have a head and a body inside of my top level HTML tag. And then within the head, I have a script. And within my body, I have an H1 and a div. Within the div, I have, and these are functions. I'll show the implementation of these later. But yeah, that's how that works. Um, yeah, so let's get started. <laughs> and like I said, this is buggy, so there may be some issues, but that's fine. We're doing a live coding session. So we'll, we'll run into some issues and then we'll fix them accordingly. And so that'll, we'll kind of get up to speed on how to use um, all of these things. So hold on, I have to, uh, um, get my IP address here and so yeah so this is the to-do app and so let's just kind of look at um, so I can go ahead I'll, I'll delete this and I'll kind of show so bam that was HTMX right there I click delete it sent a delete request to the server 
and let me show what the, that endpoint is on on the server side right here. Um, okay, so I have here the forget to do button. So this is the button that I just clicked, and that's what made the to do uh, become deleted. So it, it sent a. I'm using the hx delete attribute, and so that's sending a delete, uh, HTTP delete to this URL, to this endpoint, and we've deleted that to do. And um, and to show the actual endpoint that receives that request, so this is the forget to do endpoint. It takes the delete method. It checks to see that the first path parameter is to do's. And then we get the second path parameter, the to do ID. And then we go to our database and we go ahead and delete the to do based on the ID. And then I'm selecting all the to do's from the database and then I'm returning a to do's table. So in this case, because I deleted that to do, we have no more, but let me make another one. And that was also just now another HTMX interaction. So when I click on this create to do button, my server responds to that and it puts a form into the DOM. And then I can go and uh, make a to do here. We're going to create that. So now I have a make T to do. Let's try another one. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't even have dogs. I have cats, but just whatever. And yeah, that's that. And so each time we're creating a to do, I'm getting so basically every DOM change you're seeing here is an interaction with the server. It's an interaction between the client and the server, if that makes sense. And so yeah, whatever, create to do, and then we can delete these. Delete, delete. Before you yeah. delete all of them, can I, can I ask a question? What yeah. happens? What happens if you refresh right now? Okay. Yeah. So this my current implementation. Yeah. So if I refresh, this will just. Um, we'll go to default. So or it's, it's there. A question. If I, I'm sorry. No, it's there. That's great. I, I was I was curious if what yeah. was going to happen to the to do list. Uh. Yeah. So. But I'm glad you brought that up because there are cases in, so my current implementation of this server, it doesn't account for these edge cases, but if like I were to, let's say for example, I go to create to do, and then I refresh this page, it's gonna take me back to the original page. But HTMX provides um, some helpers that make it so if I were to go here and click refresh, it would bring back this same page. But you'll notice in this in in the um, my search bar up here, the URL doesn't change, and so but HTMX does provide facilities that allow you to update. Um, um, I, I forget the, the 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 name of the property, but basically it'll allow you to update whatever's in the user's um, search bar up here. Yeah. So there's. Um, in not just to jump in, in Angular JS, there's well, I'm sorry, Angular, and uh, probably React as well. There, there's something like called a, a UI router, right? Where basically, yeah. I, mean, I think the way HTMX is set up, it seems like you can update frames inside of the HTML. Is that is that correct? Like just just the individual yep. frame. Um, That's exactly correct. Yeah. And then, um, but but sometimes. You can have it so it'll update the state of the URL, um, so that like if you go back to a, like basically so you don't break the back button, right? So like exactly. you can you can return to a a previous state that you were at before or a view that you were at before. Yes. Yes, exactly. So as you can see, like I hit back right there and it took me back. Um, so yeah, I haven't implemented um, you know the code to handle those edge cases. Ideally, you would. Um, 
but yeah. So, so sorry, I, I, I uh, yeah, I got confused here. Um, uh, yeah. So when you had the to-do list and you hit refresh, it 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 just returns itself. But when you hit yeah. back and got to the to-do app form page and hit refresh, it goes to the list. What? Why is that happening? So are you are you? So you're asking like why? The, here, I, it looked like when you hit refresh, it went to the to-do list. But when you were on the to-do list yeah. and you hit refresh, it just, it was fine. So wh why did it break on one part and not the other? Yeah, I, I, I so, think this was Chris's question as well, but I, I got lost somewhere along the way. Yeah, so basically, I mean, what I have in this, in the bar is when I hit refresh, it's going to make requests to... Um, whatever URL I have in my, my search bar right here. So this is the URL for the home page. And so he, every time I hit refresh, it's just loading the HTML for the home page, if that makes sense. Um, I got confused and, as to what the home page. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I get it. Now. Yeah. You, uh, sorry. So this, you can keep going, but I think I, yeah, no it. problem. Yeah. It is kind of, because it's, it's kind of a new way to think about, you know, how state is kind of transferred between the client. And, and so then the, the cool thing about this is that, um, yeah, I mean, as I kind of talked about earlier, it's the server managing all of the state. Um, and so I, I think, um, you know, once you get used to it, it actually does simplify a lot of things. And so, we don't have like a separate router for the front end and a separate router for, it's kind of all of the same. Um, but yeah, when we do make these HTMX interactions, it doesn't load the URL into the bar unless we specify it to do so. And I haven't done that in this case. Um, but yeah, ideally you would. And um yeah, so that's another interaction right there. So I just made this make T to do. I basically turned it into complete. If I were to hit this again, it would make it incomplete. And so all this is doing is swapping a button. So another cool thing about this is that the, the DOM swaps can be very fine grained. So in this case, I'm making a request to the server to make this to do incomplete and then it just returns a new button so now that the to do is incomplete i'm going to return a button so that the user can turn it into complete and so if i were to click this again so let's say i made my t so now i'm going to click complete and now my to do has been updated to a state of complete and i got the incomplete button back if that makes sense. So yeah, I basically put that here just to show that these DOM updates can be very fine grained. Um, and I'll kind of show the endpoint for that as well, just so we can see like, what am I returning? Uh, so I have an endpoint called um, edit to do status. And so this is taking a put request to the endpoint uh, to do's. It's making sure that there's a path parameter to do's. So it would be that that matches on that. And then this is matching on the second path parameter, which is the to do ID. And that's binding it to to do ID. And then this right here is just to check that there's no more path parameters after that. If I were to remove this, this path end right here, then I could just have anything after that um, second path parameter and it wouldn't matter. It would still accept it. It would still route the request to this handler. But because I have path end right here, it's making sure, okay, we have to do's, and then we have a to-do ID, and then it's nothing after that. And then here we're getting a query parameter to get the current status of the to-do. 
And so this is what I kind of mean about encoding the state of the application in the HTML because we'll, we'll see. Um, so this is the key right here. I'm returning um, a to-do status button. And so that's what that incomplete, complete button was. And now that I'm kind of going through it, it's kind of like weird to kind of, uh, it's like, is it really updating the to-do on the back end? And yes, it is. So I'll kind of show, like th this is the, um, this is the, the function that updates the status to the new status, depending on which type of button the user clicked. And then I'm returning um, the new button. So, and that replaces the button that the user just clicked on. And so let's look at the flip to do status button because this is the HTML that I'm returning. So if we go check that out, um, so we have the flip to do status button. It's just a button, um, but it has this HX put attribute and it's making a put request to the to do's with the correct uh, to do ID and with the status of that to do. And um, yeah, depending on the to do status, if it's incomplete, well, we're returning a complete button because it's incomplete. We want the user to click on complete if they completed it. And if it's a to do that was already complete and for whatever reason the user wants to bring it back to incomplete, they can click on the incomplete button. And so, yeah, this kind of goes back to this idea of like, the state of the application is encoded in the HTML because depending on the to-do, that determines what action the user is gonna get. So if it's a to-do that's complete, they're gonna get an incomplete button. If the to-do is incomplete, they're gonna get a complete button. And so that's kind of how that works. And I, my apologies, that's kind of weird to understand, but um, is there any questions about that or any? Um, any ideas or? Or is that pretty much make sense? <laughs> I do have a, I a question, but if <clears throat> yes, please. it's not really related to that. Um, I was okay. curious. So yeah. Do you know if HDMX has like polling? So like, can you if? Yes. If, HTMX does have polling, yep. Oh, that's nice. Is it? So, yeah. I think you were going to bring up like a scenario, like what kind of scenario were you thinking of using that? Um, so I actually, well, I really like this architecture. I, I was actually thinking of um, replacing some of our front end with, uh, well, basically we use giraffe in the back end, and, but I think this is like a good oh, that's option cool. for fixing some of the front end. Um, but, the example that I have in mind is basically, mm -hmm. uh, well, it's not really REST. It's sort of like a remote procedure call where the procedure takes a long time to run. So like we run a lot of things that take, you know, simulation or something like that that takes a really long time to run. Um, right. And so basically we just want something where, you know, you make a post and then it keeps pulling the server until it's complete and then it renders the page. Yeah, yeah, um, I think that's a great use case. And yeah, HTMX does have support for polling. Um, so like, I'm just bringing this up from the documentation. Maybe we can like do like a quick demo of something. Like I was just thinking like uh, a counter that updates like every two seconds and the HTMX will poll the server. Like I would like to implement that a little bit after this. Um, sure. Just to kind of play around with it, but yeah. HTMX does support polling and is very useful. Um, there's load delays, as you can see, load polling. I've never even used that before, but that's possible. Um, there's really a lot you can do, honestly. It's, it's, it's really impressive. And uh, yeah, I, I recommend um, if you go on uh, Twitter and follow HTMX.org, you'll see he, he posts a lot of examples of people making really cool things with HTMX. 
like this to do app, it doesn't really do it justice at all. I just kind of chose something really basic just to get the idea um, out there. But you can really, um, like there's not really anything I can come up with, at least me. And you know, I'm, I'm compared to a lot of web developers, I'm very junior, so it's not really saying much, but um, I rarely can come up with something that's like, hmm, I really, I need to use an SPA framework for this because it's like, I feel like anything I would need to do, I can do it in HTMX. I need handles, even animations and things like that. Um, it just has a lot of cool stuff. There's also support for web sockets and server side events and things like that. Um, so yeah, that is very much well supported, a lot of stuff. So I have a, I have a question. This might yeah. be a little too off topic, but um, no, not at all. And I, I'm not an expert in this stuff either. But how, like, a lot of this stuff that you're talking about and the sort mm -hmm. of the mission of uh, hate OAS, yeah, um, kind of sounds very broadly like uh, the Elm architecture. Um, yeah. What do you? What's your take on? overlap or just just what do you think of, of the similarities there? I think there are a lot of similarities, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I did think about that before. Um, <laughs> I was like, wow, this is kind of like um, the Elm architecture, except it's just full stack. And it, it really fits nicely with, and this kind of goes into like the original, I mean, we're talking about Dr. Roy Fielding, he's like, the father of the REST architecture, and he's written a lot of the RFCs for, you know, HTTP, and a lot of these other protocols that web developers use, and um, HTMX pretty much completes his vision because, you know, the REST architecture is supposed to be stateless, and, um, mm -hmm. you know, this really fits nicely because we're, performing an action that's sent to the server and then the server's returning more HTML to perform more actions. And so it's kind of like, we kind of, it's, it's not, obviously there's state on the server. Mm -hmm. I mean, there has to be state somewhere, but it's all in one place. So I guess in Elm, you could, it, you know, looking at it from the Elm architecture perspective, uh, where you have a model and you're making calls against that model and then you get a new model. Um, yeah, this is kind of the same idea where your server is kind of like, well, the, the HTML that your server generates is the model. And right. then based on right. that model, you get access to other endpoints in the server. And um, yeah, it's really nice. And, and another cool thing is that, um, you know, the client doesn't have to have any knowledge of the server really at all. All it needs to be able to do is, you know, understand these URLs, make requests to the URLs, and then just put the HTML, it gets back into the DOM. And so the client really has no knowledge of the server at all. I mean, it just knows that it's getting HTML. I'm making requests. So it's really a really, really dumb client. And then so your mm -hmm. server's like, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's a really thick server. And so it's, yeah. uh, like I said earlier, it's kind of going back to the, you know, how things were done back in the day where we're just really doing server side rendering. That's pretty much it. And HTMX is just handling all of the DOM swapping and all of that good stuff. So we don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think that's very nice. But yeah, I do really like that analogy. Yeah, I really do. So, so, yeah, it's, uh, it seems like a, like, to me, it, like, almost like a Elm light, you know? Like, yeah. to me, it's a little easier to understand than the whole conceptual apparatus of Elm. Um, and yeah. it seems to achieve similar goals. Yes, very much so, yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, I kind of brought up Elm earlier, you know, a lot of ha when I got into Haskell web development, that was kind of like the main well, was like, okay, 
I want to implement, I, I need a front end for my web application. What am I going to write it in? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was GHCJS, but the, the, the tool chain for that is just overly complicated, in my opinion. And, you know, Elm was just kind of like, it's easy to get started with, you know, the Elm architecture is pretty intuitive. And um, so, yeah, that was my go to for implementing, you know, the clients for my web applications for a long time. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I like HTMX as an alternative just because I can do everything in Haskell. Um, and yeah, I, I get to keep a lot of those, the things I like about Haskell without mm -hmm. introducing a new tool chain or anything. So yeah, yeah. that's really nice. I think Claude was going to say something. Or... Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so okay. So, I guess I should preface this. I haven't done real web development in decades. Like, I did it professionally, like for the original Active Server pages, right? So, server side okay. everything. Um, okay. This sounds this is like perfect for you. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. So I kind of like this. This sounds like it's Ajax. Like. Yep. Yeah, under the hood, I it is actually using Ajax. Yeah, except the only difference is, you know, you're using it through the attributes in your HTML, which completely changes everything because no longer do I have to explicitly make um, Ajax calls using JavaScript. Um, yeah, it, the HTMX handles all of that. And yeah, so it is Ajax pretty much except now it's a part of html and so that's you know that kind of goes back to like how this is an extension of uh of the hypertext it's kind of making it what it was originally supposed to be because um you know as we discussed earlier plain html5 is just limited i mean you only have two options with interacting with the cert for to interact with the server and so this just opens up everything um all within HTML. And so it's very nice. And I would say, yeah, if you've been doing, um, if you're only familiar with like server side rendering or anything like that, this is perfect for you. Because now you don't have to go and learn React or Savelle or any of these other, you know, SPA frameworks. All you need to know is um, HTML, no backend programming, obviously, for your server. And then you just learn these attributes and you can just really get going. So I think that's really cool. And yeah, I think the, uh, yeah, it's very nice and convenient. I would say <laughs> it was really for me convenient because I, um, and not, not that I have, not that I'm like completely against SPA frameworks. Like obviously SPA, SPA frameworks have their place for sure. And um, if you would err, if you were to, you know, try and build something like Google Docs, for example, um, that might not be too, I don't think you could do this in HTMX probably. This is an example, like some something where you need offline first functionality might not be the best use case. Although I am working on a tool that might remedy that um, by like using caching and stuff like that. So like if you were to go offline, you could still use um, an HTMX a web app that was built using HTMX. But um, yeah, that's just one idea. But um, so yeah, yeah, I think I think it's great. So is there any other questions or ideas that anybody has or? What about, um, I guess, security? Does it does it manage like authorization authentication? Um, so you have to handle it. Uh, yeah. HTMX itself doesn't handle it. Um, yeah. so the but recommended like, way. Mm. But it accepts like I'm bearer sorry. tokens. I guess bearer tokens would come in in the um, the request to the server. So it's probably. Yes, exactly. So okay. it's like. Yeah, based on, so you can you use headers and things like that, obviously, for like JWTs. Well, the, the recommended way is to use cookies, like mm -hmm. you would traditionally, 
do it. I, I guess since, you know, the prominence of SPAs, JW, uh, JWTs have kind of become the standard. But um, yeah, you can use either one for authentication and things like that. And you can send headers with your HTMX requests. So like this HX post, I could send a header with this, maybe including uh, a session token or whatever. Um, I'll actually try and look for that. It's called HX um, headers. So yeah, you can add headers that will be submitted with the request. And so this is what it would look like. And so, yeah, you can put any, whatever information you would like in there. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I guess I, I'm, I'm kind of curious if there's applications to this, like, to like an enhanced Jamstack site, like not even getting rid of JavaScript, just pulling in JavaScript as sort of a separate library and letting Yep. HTMX interact with the um, the server. And so the main use case of this is like the front end developers I've worked with, they're always sort of complaining that um, there's very little, it's hard to get any kind of like isomorphism between the front end and the back end with, with JSON. So basically yeah. you have to like pass it, you have to serialize the JSON and then deserialize it on the front end. And if it changes on one side, it has to change on the other side. It's really annoying. So, I mean, it, it, it seems like it might, makes sense if you know this kind of thing where the the host for interaction with the server but then potentially have like for any kind of high performance or browser performance uh tasks run um you know run an sba because I'm, I'm kind of thinking like you know you know one thing elm does very well is uh 3d graphics and i feel like this probably would not do that as well <laughs> Yeah. But um yeah. But maybe, I don't know, maybe maybe there's a opportunity for implementing some sort of you know 3JS in there. But yeah. Sure. Um, I like it. Yeah, possibly, you know, this is still like pretty much in its infancy, you know, and um so we're, uh, you know, people are still discovering a lot of cool new things. You know, I really um, recommend checking out the Discord. It's very, um, I should have it somewhere. And I kind of also want to show this just so I can show everybody, like, uh, the community is quite large. And there's, you know, people from various languages um, using HTMX. Well, now it's asking me to log in. Um, I don't know why, but anyway, basically there's a channel for like every language you could think there's, um, one for Haskell developers, one for Elixir, Lisp users, F sharp users. Like there's a lot of people coming from there because as I mentioned earlier, HTMX is language agnostic, you know, as long as you can generate HTML, you're good to go. And so a lot of people are really taking a liking to that and really come, come and really embrace HTMX, which I think is great. And that's actually what led to the development of um, Okapi. So I didn't know about, so I, that's how I learned about Giraffe. You know, there was a guy in the F sharp, the HTMX F sharp channel. He was posting a lot of cool stuff and I was like, wow, you know, a lot of the web frameworks in Haskell are kind of bloated. You know, I'd like something like Giraffe. And because Giraffe and Haskell are like, I mean, F Sharp and Haskell are really related to each other. You know, I thought, why not um, have something like Giraffe in Haskell? And so that's how uh, Okapi came to be. So. Yeah, I thought I, I wanted to comment that your Okapi looked really nice. and. Uh, uh, Chris and I use F Sharp at work, but um, and, and so we're familiar with Giraffe, and I I really like what you did. Yeah, it's um, really simplifies a lot of things. I think um, it I, it doesn't provide you know it's not like a full. I'm I'm not sure if maybe some people are familiar with the Asode or um, that's like one of the more popular Haskell frameworks, but it's like a basically a Ruby on Rails. Um, and it's, it, there's just a lot of magic involved there's a lot of metaprogramming and, um, 
it, it, it's good for getting you up and started quickly once you understand everything, but it's just a lot bloated for my taste. You know, I wanted something more lightweight. So that's the inspiration for OKP. You know, the inspiration was like giraffe, flask from Python. So it's just really, it's just a monadic DSL for implementing. Um, and this is very interesting too, as well. I'll probably do a separate talk on that sometime in the future. Um, but yeah, I'd like to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. But yeah, shout out to Giraffe for <laughs> for doing it first. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've only somewhat played around with Haskell web development, and it's yeah, everything that I came across was very big, um, which yeah. was surprising given how devoted Haskell is to minimalism, <laughs> you know, to a fault. <laughs> yeah, that's the, you know, um, I think um, a lot of the Haskell community, they have a tendency to get caught up in, too caught up in these complicated abstractions. And, uh, right. you know, they're nice and beautiful, I think, in a lot of ways, but they have to be used correctly. Like for instance, Okapi, um, this is all completely based on monads. And so this is a, essentially, yeah, it's a monadic DSL. And so, but this is like way more approachable than, you know, a lot of these other features, a lot of these other Haskell fra web frameworks, they use like type level programming and Mm -hmm. template Haskell, which is like metaprogramming. And it's very, like I wanted something where like I could just, you know, maybe go to somebody who's um, used to using Express, like Node.js Express, and I could like show them this and it wouldn't be that intimidating, I think, mm -hmm. because it's like, okay, okay, it has to have the get method and we have to check that the first path parameter is greet. And we can get a path parameter or a query parameter that has a name and, yeah. you know, so on and so forth. I feel like it's just a lot easier to explain. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the way you've got that set up there, I mean, you're you're just a couple of curly braces away from a computation expression in F sharp. Yeah. And I yeah. think those are a lot easier it's to read. The equivalent. Yeah. Yep. The do syntax. So. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So yeah. I guess, did anybody want to see that polling example really quickly? I just kind of yeah. want to implement implement a counter really sure. quick just to see. I'm just going to slap this onto my to-do app. Let's just do it really quickly. I know it's going to be nine um, in a bit, but let's just do this for fun because why not, right? Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to define a counter endpoint right here. And... Uh, counter so monad okapi and so this is just basically saying you know we're operating with a monad that um has access to the um the the state of the request so whatever http request and we're basically performing a series of checks on the request so like as an example this right here checks that the method is a get request. If it's not, this will fail and it'll try the next thing in, in line. So that's how this works basically. That And this is what this operator does. It's basically saying, okay, if that doesn't work, then try this one. If that doesn't work, then try the next one. And it's performing these series of checks against the request and verifying that, okay, this is the right request for for this handler. And so I'm checking, okay, is it a get 
the request is the first path parameter to do's and then is it an end and then does it have a query parameter representing the status and this is optional um, and so yeah it's just basically a set of small combinators and stuff but let's go ahead and implement our counter so it's going to be a get request and uh so let's see we're gonna do so yeah i was gonna make it where okay so like one thing we could do we could like have a variable on the server so like uh, you could use like an io ref in haskell that's basically like a mutable variable that we can store the state so the number so our, our state for this counter is just going to be a number but I think what I'm going to try, so we can actually make this stateless, though. We can do this in a stateless way because, so, like, um, well, well, let's see, let's see. So I'm going to just, we're going to say, okay. So I want to check that. So our entry point is going to be counter. So it should basically match against the URL like this, counter. And then for the second uh, for the second argument, it's going to be an integer representing the current state of the counter. So let's do that. Count. And uh, we might have to make that optional because to start off, it's not going to have any count. So let's see. Um, so and then presumably we're just this say, start off at zero, right? Yeah. So, um, and then we're going to return. So this isn't something that's usually done in how I actually introduced this operator just to make things, I don't know, maybe easier for others that are familiar with it, but that's like the pipe operator. So that would pipe into and um, yeah we're just going to return the count so and actually so yeah I was going to so let's see set lucid I'm going to have to render that so I'm going to have to say uh, uh, let me do Well, first, well, first, let me let's add a, the actual state of the counter to the page. So let me see. So, um, okay, let's add a, a a counter button to this, or we can just add the counter HTML like that. Uh, so I'm going to define the counter HTML. First, let's do that just so we can get something on the screen. So that's just going to be some HTML. And we're going to use that polling attribute that we were looking at earlier. And so I'm just going to make this a div, I'm thinking. And um, it's just going to start at zero. And then let's go back to the documentation here. Because I, I don't really use this uh, polling attribute, but so this will be fun. Uh, uh, what was the name of it? Oh, well, it's a, it's the HX trigger. And so, yeah, like, let's copy that. And so, like, let's get, let's trigger this URL, the counter URL, like every, so let's see. So, yeah, in Lucid, this is just going to be hx get and we're going to make a request to counter slash and i'm going to concatenate zero to that because we're going to start off with a zero so like the entry point to our application the counter is starting off at zero so when they come to the home page and then we're going to trigger 
this every two seconds. Well, let's just do every one second. So we don't grow old doing this. And so, yeah, the initial state, so I can actually, yeah, I could just, have, I could have abstracted this out into a variable, but we'll just do zero, zero for now. And then, okay, let's see what that looks like first. So, and, um, well, I guess we can just go ahead and implement that. So we're making a trigger to this request. We're making a get request to the counter every one second. And then we're, we're let's also specify the target, HX target. And we're going to set it to outer HTML. And I'll, I'll kind of show what that means later. But basically, we're saying we want to replace this div, this entire div, each time the counter is triggered. So whatever, whatever response we get from the server, it's going to replace this div right here. And so actually, because I'm going to use this in two places, I actually should abstract this out. So it's just count and count. And I'm going to have to do uh, to show count to HTML just so that works right. And then let's see if this compiles really quick. Well, let me, and then, and actually, let me just bring this down here so I'm not scrolling back and forth. Uh, counter. So yeah, path param is counter. Okay, and this is no longer there. This is going to be guaranteed to be there. The second path parameter is going to be an int. And yeah, we're just gonna. And then what we're going to return is the new counter HTML, but it's going to be the new count. And we're going to return that. So we're so this okay is just it's just a generic two hundred okay response. We're modifying the body of that response so that it returns this counter HTML with the new count and it's returning it. So because this returns a response. Um, so yeah, let's see what happens now. This might this might not compile yet, but we'll fix it. Okay. Okay, yeah, of course. So Put a dollar sign right there. Mm, it says, okay, it's applied to too few arguments, right? So, um, yeah, right here. So our counter is going to start off at zero. So that's what we want. And uh, okay, let's try it and let's see if this works because it looks like it compiled but let's see if it works though and then we can even open up the dev tools and then see making requests every so cabal exec to do oh no it's do to do exe and so let's see what happens here so if I reload it, we should go back to the home page. And OK, so I notice nothing's updating. But let's see. OK. So you see it's, it's being triggered every one second, but there's a target error. So we have to figure that out. Um, I'm not sure what's going on there. Let's see. Because, um, well, let me add, because it might not be obvious here so i'm just going to add an id to this call it counter okay so yeah i messed up here so the hx target that this attribute determines what object in the dom is being swapped out i should have just used hx swap so the swap determines what type of swap you're doing are you replacing the outer html the inner html uh, so there's a lot of, you know, variations with that. You can really, you can replace the sibling of the element. And so we're, we can really manipulate the DOM like a surgeon just from our server. It's pretty cool.
So let me see. Let me build that. So hopefully, let's see if this works. Because by default, the target is itself. So it should just replace itself every one second. But we'll see if my assumption is correct. I, I believe that's how it works. Yeah. Let's see what happens here. OK. Cabal execute. Let's see. OK, there we go. Nice. So we have like that's really one. cool. Yeah, so that's an example of polling, a uh, very basic example. And notice, like, I could have did it where, you know, I, I use an IO ref and I store the state, like, on the server explicitly, right? Like, in a, inside of a variable, and then I read from the variable and then send that. But here, the state is completely within, encoded in the HTML. Because I have a count, it starts off at zero. And I'm storing that state inside of this URL. So it's going to make a GET request with its current count. And then the server is going to take that and say, OK, where well, your new count is whatever count you pass as a path parameter plus one. And then I'm going to send you back the new HTML. And it's just so it's kind of like a recursive type of thing going on. So if you if you refresh the count will go back to zero, but if you store the count as a yep boundary. yeah if I were to refresh this it should yeah it goes back to zero yep okay. cool thank you so much I know it's it's tricky to do live coding like that but it made it look easy yeah <laughs> yeah very nice looking <laughs> yeah just uh, this was a good talk I had fun for sure so I I, 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 I think hope you practice that. Something. And 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 even practice the the errors because yeah. it did seem a little too seamless. Yeah. <laughs> and planted yeah. the questions, right? Like planted the people in the audience. <laughs> well, you guys afterwards, don't worry. Yeah. You guys are gonna get you know, I'm just playing. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, but yeah, like I said, I mean, we just scratched the very surface of this today. And, you know, if you guys are thinking about using this, you know, it, it's really easy to integrate into whatever existing system you have. I mean, like I said, at my job, we introduced it to like our pretty complicated, big, nasty, uh, you sold application and it fits in pretty smoothly. Um, so, yeah. I like it. This is really cool. Yeah. All right. This this was really fun. Um, so thank you so much. And I thank think um, I'm going to stop the recording. And then if there are any additional questions, we can chat for a little bit longer. So yep. let me figure out how to stop the recording. That's good. All right. Thank you. Thank you.